Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to say that it's brought to you by me, or rather another channel that I do called Business Blaze. It's about business, but it's interesting. But like I say, at some point when this channel's huge, what I will do is I will sell these old scripts and I'll donate all the money to a charity that does, like, environmental sh something. So if this channel's not successful, you're destroying the environment. Tell a friend. It looks at the most epic failures and the things that went wrong, but also little known success stories. Generally, just the weirdest stuff I find from the business world, like why the 50 pound note in the UK is just for criminals, stuff like that. It's more laid back than this channel throwing a good amount of silliness and fun at you, along with some facts. She is the queen. She, it's like, she, she should be wearing a crown, like tiara's like, a light day. Check it out through the link below. Now let's get into today's video. Imagine the scenario. You have an adorable grandmother, beloved by friends and family. She tends to her roses, she bakes pies, and grows her own vegetables. You know, she works for some sort of government outfit, something to do with science and metals. You know that now and then she takes long trips to the other side of town. You don't know exactly where she is going or who she is meeting, but she always looks excited. Then one day, you wake up and you find her name in the papers. Evidently, your grandmother has been spying for your country's enemies, the USSR. This is what happened to today's protagonist, Melita Norwood, beloved secretary, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, who for 40 years delivered nuclear secrets to the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War. Melita Norwood was born Melita Cernus on March 25, 1912, in Bournemouth, England. Her parents were Alexander Cernus, a Latvian emigre, and Gertrude Stedman, an English suffragette. Alexander had an interesting background. He had worked as a secretary for literal giant Leon Tolstoy, author of War and Peace, among other masterpieces, but he had to flee from the final days of the Russian Empire because of his revolutionary leanings. As an exile, he found employment as an estate manager for Tolstoy's literary executor Vladimir Chertkov. Eventually, he followed his employer to the village of Tuckton, Hampshire, southern England. This was a place that was home to numerous Russian expats. Here, Chertkov founded a colony, organized in line with Tolstoyan principles of domestic simplicity and strict nonviolence, in which personal possessions were discouraged. While in Tuckton, Alexander had also joined the Social Democratic Federation, a small Marxist group. He did have socialist and communist leanings, but in line with the colony principles, he did not approve of revolutionary methods, at least not until the First World War. This was a watershed moment for many leftists across England and Europe, which led to them becoming disillusioned with alliance colonialism and the political realities of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In October of 1917, Alexander looked on in admiration at the events unfolding in Petrograd, the Russian Revolution, of which he became a vocal supporter. His boss, Cherkov, was recalled to Moscow by Lenin to curate the publishing of Tolstoy's social essays, much liked by the Bolsheviks. Alexander could not join him, as he fell ill with tuberculosis, eventually dying on Armistice Day, November 11, 1918. Did Alexander's communist sympathies have an impact on Melita's later life? For sure, father and daughter had a close bond, but Melita was only six at the time of his death, probably too young to grasp the implications of revolutionary socialism. However, we should not discount the influence of the broader environment that she grew up in. She later described her childhood in the Tuckton colony as idyllic, which may have given Melita a rose-tinted view of communism. This view was reinforced by mum Gertrude, who consistently referenced communism as a utopian ideology. On a more practical level, Gertrude gave to Melita an early taste of covert operations for the greater cause of Bolshevism. Throughout Melita's childhood, she acted as a secret conduit between the party and Moscow and British Communist headquarters in King Street, London. She and fellow party members even recruited British communists to be sent to Moscow to train as undercover radio operators. Melissa grew up to become a bright young girl, which she proved in 1923 by winning a scholarship to attend Itchen School, a secondary school near Southampton in southern England. In 1928, she was appointed school captain, a promising achievement to her future academic career. Upon graduation in September of 1930, Melita enrolled in Southampton University 
university college, but she didn't really thrive there. At the urging of her mother, she had signed up for logic and Latin, two courses she eventually came to dislike. Apparently, during the first year at uni, all Melita learned was how to ride a motorcycle. She eventually quit her courses and moved to Paris to her mother's despair. In the spring of 1931, Gertrude managed to drag Melita and her younger sister Gertie to Heidelberg, Germany, in an effort to have her resume her studies. It was futile. This time, Melita picked up a new passion, field hockey. She and Gertie joined a team coached by Professor Munther, head of anatomy at Heidelberg University. The Cernus family became good friends with the professor, a left-wing social democrat and anti-Nazi activist. The Cernus girls joined him in many demonstrations against the National Socialist Party, during which they came face to face with the SA, the brown shirts, but luckily were not involved in any violence. These are the moments that shaped Melita's leftist stance. Socialism was the only sensible counterweight to the rise of authoritarian regimes in Europe. Nineteen thirty two was a watershed moment for Melita, and don't forget she was only twenty at this point. Here she displayed strong leadership skills by becoming an organizer for the Association of Women Clerks and Secretaries. During this period, she also married her fiance, Hilary Nussbaum, who later anglicized he and his wife's surname to Norwood. Melita was clearly allergic to spare time because in nineteen thirty two Melita also became a member of the Independent Labour Party, and joining one party may not have been enough. According to historian Christopher Andrew, Melita had a more covert alliance as a secret member of the Communist Party of Great Britain. We will meet Christopher Andrew again later, and you'll see why the intrepid historian is so relevant to our story. But for the moment, let's shift our attention to another Andrew. Here he is, our second Andrew making his entrance stage left, of course. His name is Andrew Rothstein, and he is introduced to Melita by none other than her mother, Gertrude. Melita and Rothstein became close friends, some might even say intimate friends. Their meetings were usually carefully planned to prevent prying eyes from taking too close a notice of where their hands were laying or what their lips were whispering. There wasn't anything untoward in this two friends' relationship. Well, at least nothing that would count as adultery. Rothstein was, in fact, a Soviet secret agent. He was Melita's recruiter and first handler, the one who put her into contact with the NKVD, Stalin's secret police, and the precursor to the KGB. Thanks to Rothstein's influence, Melita had begun to spy on the UK scientific and military community on behalf of the Soviets. Her code name was Holla. In addition to her broader pro-communism political motives, she feared a world in which Western Europe, and later the US, would hold exclusive, unchallenged nuclear power. Agent Holler's initial role was to work with a Soviet spy ring operating inside the Royal Woolwich Arsenal in London. This vital plant was dedicated to manufacturing heavy guns for naval use, as well as field guns and other artillery equipment for the army. For a while, everything went smoothly, but in January 1938, MI5 intervened. For those not familiar with the organization of British secret services, MI5 is the agency in charge of domestic security and counter-espionage, while MI6 leads overseas operation. When MI5 got winds of the leak of secrets from the arsenal, they arrested the three leading members of that ring. Interestingly, at this stage, they could have easily got a hold of Agent Holler, but she escaped their net. Her secret power was fantastically ordinary. She was a woman facing condescending male agents who could not fathom that a young secretary could be capable of spying. But let me give you some more details. In the early 1930s, MI5 agent Maxwell Knight was probably the only operative who believed women made better spies than men. That is why he recruited Mona Mourns, the middle-class daughter of a retired officer. Her mission was to infiltrate the British Communist Party as a typist. Mona had a quality for observing anything, while other people hardly took notice of her. This is how she began suspecting Melita would be involved. She seemed to be a very active member in the party, but was prone to long disappointment appearances from time to time. Mona filed a report with Knight, who trusted her intuition. But when Knight briefed his superior, Jasper Harker, the report it was just ignored. Harker believed that women could not make spies and concluded that Norwood was simply not worth investigating. Following this close brush with the enemy, the NKVD handlers advised Melita to go on ice until further notice. Knowing her aversion to inaction, it must have been agony. 
Luckily for Melita, her time on the bench it was short. She resumed her duties as Holler again just a few months later, in May of 1938. Then, the following year, Rothstein transitioned his handling duties to a recently immigrated agent, Ursula Burton. Ursula had landed in Great Britain posing as a German Jewish refugee fleeing from the Nazis, and she quickly established a new Soviet spy ring, codenamed Sonia. This new ring reported not only to the NKVD, but also to the lesser-known GRU, the Soviet Military Intelligence Agency. By 1941, the Sonia ring included our protagonist, Melita, among its ranks, as well as notorious double agent Klaus Fuchs, a German dissident scientist who publicly supported the British war effort, only to defect to the Soviets at a later stage. Now, you might be wondering at this point, what could the strategic military value of a secretary working for the BNFMRA possibly be? And while we're asking questions, why were the Soviets spying on the UK during World War II? After all, they're supposed to be allies. Let's start with the second point. A UK-USSR alliance was not a given at the start of the war. The Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact of August 1939 had formally tied Germany and the Soviets in an opportunistic anti-Polish alliance. It wasn't until the onset of Operation Barbarossa in June 1941 that the UK and later the US had linked arms with Stalin in order to defeat the Axis powers. Moreover, by the early 1940s, all the major powers had kick-started their atomic programs. And the Soviets had no scruples about spying on their allies to get a head start in the business of splitting atoms. As for our other question, Melita worked very closely with the director of BNFMRA, a man by the name of G.L. Bailey. Bailey was a member of the advisory committee for another company, Tube Alloys, but this rather innocent and, dare I say, boringly named company was just a front for the British Atomic Bomb Project. The link between the two companies was strengthened in March 1945 when BNFMRA won a contract from Tube Alloys. It was Melita's biggest opportunity yet. She would sneak into her boss's office, open his safe, and take pictures of the classified documents with a miniature camera, which she would then deliver to her handlers. The GRU was pleased, describing the findings as of great interest and a valuable contribution to the development of work in this field. The KGB chipped in, describing Norwood as a committed, reliable, and disciplined agent, striving to be of the utmost assistance. Honestly, this sounds a bit bland, the kind of feedback you'd get from a bored boss that a mid-year review, the kind that ends with solid performance as an appraisal and a Costa Coffee voucher as a bonus. However, the Soviet secret services really did hold Melita's work in extremely high esteem. Journalist and personal acquaintance David Burke tells us that the information she supplied on the behavior of uranium metal at high temperatures permitted the Soviet Union to test an atomic bomb four years earlier than British and American intelligence thought possible. So yes, quite an impressive contribution from our girl Melita. Without her efforts, the Soviets would have lagged four years behind the West in their development of a nuclear arsenal. Melita gave the Soviets quality information, but she also gave them quantity too. Our mystery friend Christopher Andrew would go on to claim that Norwood was both the most important British female agent in KGB history and the longest serving of all Soviet spies in Britain. The end of World War II soon gave way to the threat of another conflict, the Cold War. As the Western and Communist blocs began a decades-long staring contest from either side of the Iron Curtain, MI5 began increasing their scrutiny of suspected agents. Counterintelligence was clearly on the right path. Twice in 1947, they questioned Ursula Burton, Sonia's ringleader, but on both occasions, they did not have enough hard evidence to really do anything. Burton knew that it was only a matter of time before the handcuffs snapped on her wrists, so she absconded to East Germany. Her star agent, Klaus Fuchs was less lucky, or perhaps less skilled. He was arrested in 1950. With Sonia slowly melting around her, Melita received orders to go on ice for a second time. Once again, her hibernation did not last long. By 1951, she resumed espionage activities with additional Cold War precautions. Over the next few years, the pages of Melita's life flipped one after the other. On the surface, not much happened beyond a normal suburban life. To her friends and family, the paragraphs in Melita's book were filled with quiet evenings and white picket fences. But underneath the mirage, hidden by ciphers and invisible ink, a different story unfolded. Norwood was incredibly adept at stealing, acquiring, or copying sensitive scientific material and getting that information into the hands of GRU agents. She always maintained a low profile, limiting her deliveries to just four or five a year. Normally, these took place in the suburbs of southeast London via the usual methods favored by Soviet spycraft, the dead drop 
or the swipe. Once again, MI5 got close to arresting her. In 1965, the security service had concluded that Melita had been spying for the Soviets since the 1930s, but she was neither detained nor interviewed. Intelligence officers wanted to hide how much they knew about her activities to protect other investigations, which is understandable, but it is surprising how she was still allowed to continue handing secrets over to the Soviets. Shortly afterwards, Melita had even graduated from recruited agent to recruiter, enlisting the services of a civil servant codenamed Hunt. Agent Hunt and Agent Holler were able to pass extensive scientific and technical intelligence on British armaments to the KGB and GRU. These additional efforts were adequately rewarded by the Soviets. Melita was first awarded with the Order of the Red Banner by the KGB and offered a monthly salary of the princely sum of £20. In today's money, that's about $6,060 a year. So basically, $6,000 to risk your freedom, reputation, and possibly your life delivering classified information. That's remarkably low, especially in comparison to other documented Soviet double agents. Take the example of Robert Hansen, whom we've already covered on this channel. Hansen was an FBI agent who similarly sold secrets to the GRU and KGB, and during his first three years of activity as a double agent, he was paid $30,000 a year in today's money by the Soviets. That's five times as much as Malita. The reality was that Melita was never interested in cash. She refused the KGB salary. Double agents are known to act because of mice reasons. Money, ideology, compromise, and ego. Hansen was a money and ego kind of guy, while Norwood acted strictly off her ideology. Melita was seriously convinced that the communist cause was a worthy one, and the Soviets were the good guys during the Cold War. In 1973, Melita turned 61, and she decided to retire not only from her former employers, the BNFMRA, but also from her covert work. The spy was now a retired granny and later great-granny who spent her days tending to her vegetable garden and baking pies. As those golden years ticked away, it's hard to wonder how Melita's faith in the Soviet system might have changed as more and more reports of Eastern Bloc atrocities reached the West. And later, what was going through her head is she saw the members of the Warsaw Pact collapsing piece by piece in the late 1980s. Had it all been worth it? What would the future be like with only one superpower left in charge? And on a more personal level, would there be any consequences for double agents like her, even if retired or on ice? Unbeknownst to Melita, in November 1992, a former Soviet agent and archivist had brought thousands of documents to London that he had smuggled out of KGB headquarters. His name was Vasily Mitrikin. MI6 took charge of the wealth of information in Mitrikin's archive, and after debriefing most of their Western allies, they decided to allow its publication. In late 1995, Mitrikin was introduced to the official historian of MI5. His name was Christopher Andrew. Mitrikin and Andrew worked for years on their volume, the Mitrikin Archive, which was scheduled for publication in the autumn of 1999. By then, the ripple effects of these not-so-secret secrets had already spread across the UK government. In December 1998, British Home Secretary Jack Straw was informed for the first time about Melita's role and consulted with the security services and the Attorney General on whether to prosecute her. In April 1999, they reached a decision. No action would be taken against the former agent Holler due to her age due to the fact that 26 years had passed since her retirement as a spy. This does make some sense. However, it is also possible that Straw had considered the consequences of a public trial, namely exposing the most embarrassing past failures of MI5. Melita Norwood remains blissfully unaware of the debate surrounding her status as a private citizen in the corridors of power. By September of 1999, she had developed a friendship with author David Burke, a Russian literature scholar. Burke regularly traveled from Leeds to London to sit down with Melita Melita and interview her about her father's work with Lev Tolstoy. The two usually had Sunday lunch together, Melita fixing a dish of fish fingers, greens from her garden, and tea served in Che Guevara mugs. Apart from the last detail, sounds very English. On the 11th of that September, Burke was on his way to Melita's when he noticed an article in the Times. Featuring a preview of the Mitrikan archive, the article exposed Melita as the spy who had betrayed British secrets to the Soviets for 40 years. This was a bombshell, and the British press had a blast identifying Melita as the Great Granny Spy, or even better, the spy who came in from the co-op. David Burke immediately phoned Melita after she had been exposed and asked if the two could meet anyway. Melita replied, You'd better come next week. The world's press has found its way to my doorstep. You see, I've been a rather naughty girl. 
Indeed, Melita was being hounded by journalists offering lucrative deals for her to tell her story, but as usual, money was no big motivator for her. She even declared to the BBC, I did what I did not to make money, but to help prevent the defeat of a new system which had, at great cost, given ordinary people food and fares which they could afford, a good education, and a health service. Melita also explains that her husband, Hillary, who had died in 1986, knew all about her espionage activities. He disapproved, of course, but he had never tried to stop her. On the other hand, their only daughter, Anita, was as surprised as everybody else. When questioned about her motives, Melita added, I thought perhaps what I had access to might be useful in helping Russia to keep abreast of Britain, America, and Germany. In general, I do not agree with spying against one's country. Melita turned down all the offers from the newspapers, preferring to tell her story for free to her friend David Burke with a side dish of fish fingers. Six years later, Melita Norwood died of cancer and heart disease at New Cross Hospital, Wolverhampton, on June 2, 2005. If you want to learn more about this particular spy, we can recommend David Burke's own book, The Spy Who Came In From The Co-op, or for a fictionalized and rather embellished account, you can also check out 2013's novel Red Joan by Jeannie Rooney, adapted as a film in 2019 with Judi Dench in the lead. The effectiveness and importance of Melita Norwood as a spy has been questioned by some intelligence analysts who argued that Soviet research may have already been in possession of the so-called secrets that she delivered. However, Mitchkin's papers themselves acknowledge that Agent Holler was held in high esteem by Moscow, so much so that the KGB and GRU frequently argued on who should be handling her. The KGB even considered her to be of more value than the famous Cambridge Five, a ring of British double agents which included MI6 operatives Kim Philby and Guy Burgess, diplomat Donald McLean, art historian and art curator for the royal family Anthony Blunt, and civil servant John Cancross. These five are remembered as some of the most dangerous Western traitors in espionage history, and yet, according to the KGB, they had nothing on Melita Norwood. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, go subscribe to Business Blaze, relatively new channel I'm doing that I mentioned at the beginning. Please find it linked to below, and thank you for watching.